What's up, guys? You're listening to The Lifestyle Hub, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes and into the lives of inspiring individuals to not only educate you, but unlock your true potential to live a healthy, active, and more fulfilling life. I'm your host, Jason Grumer. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's get this show on the road. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, the leading home and commercial gym specialist in the Middle East, Ghana Fitness Supplies. Check them out at www.ghana.ae for all your fitness needs. Alrighty, guys, welcome to today's episode, and I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Dr. Natalia Spearings, who is a consultant dermatologist at King's College Hospital here in Dubai and also in London. She specializes in the diagnosis and management of skin cancer, as well as having a keen interest in aesthetic and cosmetic treatments. Nat, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. How are you? This is cool. Yeah, this is cool. It's so definitely cool. <laughs> we, this is not the first time we've sat together, is it? No, no. The first time we sat together was on a previous podcast. Yes. This is a little, little bit different today, but it it's is. very, very kind of you to come on and to chat to us. No problem. Um, today is extra special because we are here at the clinic for today's episode, and we're going to use, you know, throughout the, throughout the day, we're going to use me as a little bit of a case study for some topics. We're going to cover some Instagram questions. We had a lot of those. So sit back, relax. Hopefully, you get some good information out of today and enjoy the conversations. Dr. Natalia. Yeah. <laughs> We already touched on some of your specialities, yes. but in your own words, if someone asked you what you do for a living, how would you answer? Oh gosh, that's a, okay. Well, how, I, I'm a specialist in the uh, diagnosis and management of diseases of the skin, hair, and nails. Okay. So that's a dermatologist. Okay. So that's the definition. That's basically the definition of what a der- dermatologist is. Yeah. Okay. And how did you start? How, talk to us a little bit about how you became into dermatology. Well, I wanted to be a plastic surgeon for many, many years when I was a medical student. Um, but then I didn't like the vibe of surgery. I know, because it's like a very complicated thing. It takes the whole day. You need tons of people. So, and I'm very visual. And I kind of fell into dermatology. It was almost by accident. Like I was, it was like a process of elimination, okay. trying to figure out what specialty I wanted to do. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to do something visual because I'm a real visual kind of person. I, I have a visual memory. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of like, I just, through a process of elimination, I just went through, like I knew I didn't want to do pediatrics. I knew I didn't want to deal with, like pregnant women. Okay. So, you know, kind of taking all those ones out and then yeah. dermatology was the one that kind of fit my personality. Yes. Um, and that was how it happened. Okay. So, and so where did this all like start, stem started. from? Where were you at the time when you were going through your study and education? So I trained in London. Okay. So I went to St. George's. That's where I did my medical training. I did all my junior doctor training in London as well at the yes. same hospital. Well, the peripheral hospitals as well. And then I also did my dermatology training at St. George's. So okay. I was there. It's out in South London. Yes. I was there for... 14 years. Okay. So that's everything I did in the same place, basically. And did you come into this like straight out of high school? Where did you study? You grew up or in a similar location or you've been around a little bit? No, so my accent might give that away a little bit. So. Yeah, I didn't want to pinpoint. <laughs> I'm like, let's let's hear it from you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually Dutch by nationality. Okay. Um, but my first name is Polish. My mother's Polish. So it's, okay. Everyone thinks it's a Russian name. It's a Polish name. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, I, so my dad's Dutch. My mother's Polish. I grew up in the United States. I moved there when I was six. Okay. I went to high school in the U.S. Okay. Left the U.S. when I was 18. Moved to Holland, did the international baccalaureate so I could go to university yeah. in Europe, and then I went to medical school in London because I went London. to like a British school. Okay. So they encouraged us to apply to the UK as well. I yeah. did, got in, fabulous. Never been to London before. I was like, yeah, let's go, and I just moved. Wow. Yeah. So you moved quite a little bit. A lot, yeah. yeah moved around like, a lot. Yeah. yeah. So which definitely changes your views on a lot of things. And then when you came into this, did you feel like you felt the passion build, or was it something there? Like I know you, you as you mentioned, it was elimination, but like. You've, you're obviously very passionate about it now, and yeah. you know a lot about it. So you must <laughs> I hope so. be passionate about it. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I love medicine. So, And my dad's a doctor, and he kind of instilled that in me. My dad's really into his job, too. So, um, you know, he, he loves medicine. He kind of taught me to love medicine and, like, to, you know, the intricacies and the science behind it. And, um, I mean, I just... The, the, the ability to be able to look at something and diagnose it just by looking at it, I mean, that's something that's really cool. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, I can translate what you have into Latin and give you a Latin name and it sounds really cool, but that's basically a diagnosis. Okay. So, and yeah, that, yeah. that's like the art and science of what it is. And um, that's, you know, it started being interesting to me when I was a junior doctor. So during medical school, you're so into like doing medical school and you're so worried about 
finishing medical school that you don't really think about anything else. But once I left and started thinking, what kind of doctor do I want to be? What do, what do I want to be doing every day? Yeah. And I was like, actually, I want to be doing something where I can literally look at it and say, this is what it is. This is your treatment. Come back in three weeks. If it's better, we know because we can look as opposed to like doing scans and like doing blood tests to diagnose and manage things. Yes. I can just look at it, see it. If, it. if it's not there, the disease, it's better. Okay. So it's really simple. Yeah. So I like think I'm a simple person. You know? Okay, I can see I can see where you've connected the dots there. Yeah. Like to just it's a lot more <laughs> straightforward, right? Yeah, it's straightforward. So there's no. But then on the flip side, it's actually you, in order to be able to do that, you have to have a very good visual memory. You have to have a lot of experience. You need to see a lot of stuff because mm. everything looks red and, and flaky. Do you know what I mean on yeah. the skin? It's not all the same, obviously. Yeah. Um, so that is like that's where the art comes into it as well, and just the experience. So. It, it's a kind of a niche specialty that way and you really have to spend years and years kind of getting that type of skill. Yeah. And so that also appealed to me because my, you know, my dad always said, you only have to be really good at one thing. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm really good at just one thing. Which yeah, is, I mean, that's perfect. That yeah. is good advice. It's good advice, but, yeah. Because often people try and spread themselves too thin over different yeah. interests or topics or studies and then they don't really specialize in one. And I get, that's exactly what you do, right? Yeah. So, and how does a day in the life look for you as a specialist in dermatology? Well, I, I now get to work solely in private practice, which is great, okay. because I work between London and Dubai, and it just wasn't compatible with my NHS job. So I used to work in the National Health Service, as we all do, um, but I mean, I couldn't travel like this the way I do now. Mm. Um, so now I work purely in private practice, which is great, so I can make my own schedule. So basically I work from 12 to eight or nine, so, cause I do other things in the morning, yeah. and that's like my day, and I just see patients all day long. So I'm a clinical doctor, okay. I don't do any research or anything, um, so I spend all my time in a room like this, yes. seeing patients all day long. Okay. And that's, that's it. That's what I do. Yeah. And do you prefer having that contact time with patients and going yeah. through those conditions? I mean, I, I love talking to patients. Um, yeah. Okay. Sometimes it can get a little bit exhausting, but that's the fun part of my job is yeah. saying, you come to me, you tell me what your problem is, and then I will figure out a solution for you. Yeah. So it's, it makes every single patient is different everything. It makes my day really fun. Yes. Mostly. So, and yeah. I'd imagine you'd build up like a client base, right? Like where, because it's not, for a lot of people, it shouldn't be a one-off potentially visit. It should be some routine visits, I'd imagine, depending on the case. Depending on the type yeah. of skin condition or what we're dealing with. I mean, I don't like to do a lot of follow-ups. So I like to get the diagnosis and the management right the first time yes. and not necessarily have to have you come back. Because yeah. um, I think to me that means I like, kind of failed. Yeah. Um, but that happens. But then people have chronic skin conditions. So they do need to be reviewed every six months, every whatever. They have skin cancer, needs regular follow-up and so on. Yeah. So uh, it does depend on the patient. But yeah, you build these relationships with your patients over years. And um, that is also really nice as well. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, that's all, all part of it. What is the worst skin issue that you've ever seen? And how did you go about treating it? So um, I saw a, there's a really terrible form of um, psoriasis called rupioid psoriasis. Psoriasis is a problem where your skin kind of turns over too fast, so it doesn't have time to slough away the way your skin would normally do. Okay. And so you develop these red, flaky plaques of skin. You may have seen people with psoriasis on the backs of their elbows, their yeah. knees. Yeah. yeah, it's a really terrible condition. And if you have this really severe form, you get covered in like, I can't even describe it well because it's so horrendous you get covered in these like build up of just think of like scale but a build up of it like almost like a callus but like all over your body uh, so like, not even on the affected area no or everywhere, or everywhere is affected everywhere is affected okay. and your hands you can't move your hands because they're so think of having a callus from like lifting weights yeah. like your whole hand is a callus so you can't like use your hands everything's Jeez. cracked i mean it was the most i will never forget that patient because and he was also homeless and this is, this uh. is southwest london so you have a lot of you know, socioeconomic problems. But this poor man was homeless. He had the most terrible skin I've ever seen in my life. And we just couldn't fix him mm. because he wouldn't come back for follow-ups and things like that. It was uh, like the most so heart sink patient, but that was the most terrible skin condition I've ever seen. Okay. And so yeah. th there was, unfortunately, there was no happy ending you know of because of yeah. just the lack of follow-up. So that needed a fair bit of treatment then in that case. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, we would have been able to fix it if he had if been, he had if he had been compliant and come back for treatment and everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah so wow. It's, it's quite sad, yeah. Yeah. So, and then skincare and fitness. What what some of skincare issues people face when training? Obviously, yeah. we will touch on um, Dr. Natalia's background in health and wellness as well, because I think that's going to be a very important topic. But just in general, for a lot of the listeners who are also undergoing their own health and fitness regimes, what are skincare issues that you've maybe experienced yourself or patients have experienced that come up when people are training? Um, they're sweating daily. You know, they're moving their bodies. They're sweating in the gym. 
how you know how do they how can they, how can they manage that better? Yeah, so I think the worst thing I see from fitness training is like um, people call it butt acne. It's not acne. It's okay. like getting spots in your butt, basically. From Real like what? tight leggings. Yeah, I mean, maybe you've never what? had that. That's a thing? <laughs> That's a thing. It's not actually acne. It's a folliculitis, so it's an inflammation of the hair follicle due to irritation. It's not true acne, like spots. Uh, so, okay. But bum, bum acne, uh, as we refer to it, um, is so common, especially about women who like do spinning classes and your, you know, yes. your leggings kind of rub and, you know, For sure, on a yeah. bike and stuff. And that's, and that's something that women never... It's like even I had a patient yesterday who was she was so embarrassed to bring it up and like right before she left she's like can I ask you something about this one problem and I was like this is such a common problem I've done Instagram videos about this yeah like I talk about it all the time like this is really really common um, but that's one thing so wow. the best I mean would never you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't I mean, think of that <laughs> yeah I mean okay aside from me not having that problem. having that problem personally yeah. I don't I would imagine that a lot of people don't mm. know. And are probably a bit shy to speak about it. Yeah, they wouldn't want to talk about it. So yeah. we're getting any kind of like any kind of rash in that area due to like sweating or um, whatever. You know that people just don't want to talk about that. But yeah. it is manageable. It is treatable. So um, it is something that you should definitely like talk to your doctor about because um, it is something we can manage. The other thing, you know, things like um, acne is a major problem for yes. gym going population, especially yeah. male men who perhaps use some things to help them in the gym. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's this all this this stuff about whey protein causing acne, which isn't really true. Um, but then you have boys who use a lot of whey protein, they think that causes their acne. So acne is a big deal in the fitness arena. Yeah, like I can remember growing up like I don't know, mum would throw around a lot of things that would say, Hey, this all this is make this is causing your acne to be worse. Or you're like chocolate. Yeah, or like yeah, well mum would always be like, Are you taking like creatine or you're taking the protein powder, yeah. like whey protein? That was one. When you said that it clicked. That's or just yeah, chocolate. Is is that true? Does that have an effect on skin? No. Straight up no. Straight up no. So you don't need to give up your cre- creatine, definitely not. Where did this start from, it's, do you think? Yeah, because it comes- I feel like it's like a Maybe I don't like maybe a GP diagnosis. Like I'm trying to think, or, or just mum just making a call. Like I'm like, where did this come from? So it comes from it, this has been reported in papers and medical journals. So that's okay. where it comes from. So it comes okay. from um, the the association between acne with teenage boys and the use of whey protein shakes in the gym. So that's actually literally where it's come from. That kind of association. Okay. And then there's this idea that um, you know whey protein stimulates the release of insulin like growth factor, which is like insulin, which then causes a cascade of hormonal problems leading to raised testosterone or androgens that which leads to acne so it's the whole kind of a cascade of problems that happens yeah but in reality that's not really the case and that association is not a, they didn't really confound for, the confounders like the use of anabolic steroids sweating teenage boys having bad acne yeah just generally you know that was not kind of recognized within that yeah it makes sense so it was yeah. like thrown into the bag yeah like a not- equals b equals you know, F, which you, you're jumping to a conclusion where you're yeah. making an association, but there's no causality. Makes um, sense. So that's, you know, I have to reassure lots of parents of teenage boys that it's not the whey protein. Okay. So you guys out there, you can get onto the protein. You are fine. fine. But then the chocolate and the, and, and is, are there any foods that you can directly consume from a diet perspective and you can go, oh, well now this is flared up because of that. No. Okay. So it's very, very rare for someone to have, if you have a true food allergy, mm-hmm. like an, an anaphylactic type, type one hypersensitivity, like a true, like a peanut allergy, yes. where literally you're exposed to peanut and you almost die. Yes. That's obviously a different thing. Um, but food, yeah. So the only people who really get eczema or rashes due to food intake are like infants, like newborns, okay. who have, you know, who can't have dairy. And so this is like a baby problem because babies don't have good immune systems. They're exposed to proteins that their bodies can't handle and then yes. they have an immune response and have a rash. Okay. But in adults, it's, it's just almost impossible for an adult to have that type of a food reaction. Food reaction. Yeah, so it's not the food. It's not the strawberries. It's not the food. Yeah, it's not the straw. Yeah, because this is, I mean, I even get that with like clients that come in and when we speak about nutrition, it will always, you know, be like, oh, I think that this is coming because I've eaten that. And then they'll like, they'll be like, oh, I don't think I should be having. So the one I get a lot is protein. Yes. It's like, oh, I've got this reaction or this and it's usually a medical rela- related and they're like, is it my protein or is it creatine or something like this? And I'm like, I, like it's not. But, <laughs> but I always like go get a second opinion, like, of course, because it's not my field per se. Yeah. Maybe there's an underlying issue, but I, I would be safe to say that it doesn't correlate with the two. So That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think you're 100% correct in saying that. But a lot of doctors will still throw around the concept that, oh, dairy causes acne you need to cut down on your milk intake. And I have patients who come to me with acne and they're like, oh, my other doctor said I shouldn't eat, 
you know, drink, eat dairy anymore. So I'm a 15 year old who stopped eating dairy. Mm. And I'm like, you can't, you need to have dairy because right. you're a growing human, course, yeah. you know, so that's not great information because they're like, but my acne is still bad. I'm like, yes, that's because it's not related. Yes. Go and have some yogurt. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. So that's more of like the hormonal process going yeah. through puberty, et cetera. Exactly. Hormones changing. Exactly. So it's not, it's, it's almost never, I'm not, I'm not going to say never, but it's almost virtually never a food. Okay. So, but I get why people make that association because that's something you can control. Yes. And the natural thing for people when you have a problem is you want to control it yourself. Yeah. So if there's a, you think, okay, well, what in my environment can I control? My, my washing powder, my skincare, and my food intake. Yeah. And that's what you focus on. Yeah. Which so is almost can... never going to be an issue. No. Any of those things. Yeah, true. It makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah. So most people think like they'll grow out of acne at the mm. time you know when you're a kid you go through like in different cases like you know even just in my household alone like I went through it less severe than my brother did yeah uh, I mean why is it that like you know is it gene related yeah that that like purely that so because yeah. we lived a very similar lifestyle quite active I mean we ate the same all those kind of things that people might say are reasons but then we had totally different skin no you're t- you never twin you don't have a twin no he's not no. a twin oh okay yeah i mean that would be slightly different but yes it's but totally is that different ju- if you I, have I mean, a twin if you had a tw- if you had an identical twin and your identical twin had acne you didn't that'd be weird okay so is that it, is more common yeah so you should you know identical twins are literally identical so yes. genetics wise so okay. um everything should be <laughs> virtually the same yes. um but with with siblings and families yeah so it is genetic it's it's if you have a familial tendency it has to do with your hormones and how your your like oil glands respond to hormones, um, and everyone's a little bit different with that. But it isn't something that you can control. Okay, so you just have to run with it. You have, yeah, and you and if it's if it's bothering you to any extent, you should you should or your parents should get you treatment. So what the one thing I hate the most is when parents say to their kids, "Oh, this acne is normal. You'll just need to grow out of it," and they don't seek treatment. Address it. You know, I'm like you you, you if the kid is unhappy. You know, yeah. seek treatment for that because we can clear acne. I can clear. I can give you something, and I can make your acne go away. You don't need to have scars, and you don't need to suffer. And like you know, because it really affects. Obviously, it really affects kids. For sure, it does. Or at, and adults too. For sure, it does. Oh my god, completely. I think this is like this is definitely leading us to probably one of the biggest points of today, which I do want to touch on later. And obviously, the correlation between like self confidence and skincare and and acne, especially especially being like going through your teen teen years and then into adult years. Adult acne is still quite common, right? Like, and is there an age cap on this or it can just, it comes down to other environments? It's, it's such a, um, I cannot explain to you why certain people get, well, I try to explain why certain people get acne at certain times. So adult acne is anyone over 25. So if you're over 25, you're an adult if you have acne. Yes. I mean, it's a little bit arbitrary, but, um, so, but acne can affect you at any age at any time. And if for women, it's, pregnancy related hormone changes perimenopause you're going in the pill you're coming off the pill you know there's so many different um, elements to that which could be driving acne in an adult female yeah and so i mean i see someone who's 33 years old they never had acne before and suddenly they start getting really bad acne and i i can't explain why yeah i try but i, I can't often but i can treat it so it's okay. always treatable okay so the, in most cases there are treatments oh there's definitely we have great treatments yeah okay so if you're out there and you're listening and you have acne. And you have acne. You know, don't suffer. See a doctor who knows what they're doing and get them to fix it. <laughs> That's a reassuring thought because I think a lot of people, like, I definitely know people undergo that, like, the condition with having acne and don't do anything because they yeah. don't think they can. Yeah, and that's really sad. Yeah. And do you yeah, have that a lot when people oh, yeah, come in? Yeah. They're like, oh my yeah. God, how did you fix this? Oh, it's gone. It's, how did that happen yeah, so quickly? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so like if one patient, if like a, fa- a family friend or whatever sees that their friend, you know, their acne suddenly better, like, what did you do? How did you fix that problem? And then like mothers speak to each other and, you know, that's how the information gets propagated. Yes. And I don't know why it's not more, I don't know. I don't know why people think you can't treat acne. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know where that idea comes from, but you definitely can. Okay, good. Yeah. There's an answer. There is a cure there out there, a, everybody. There's like literally a cure, yeah. So when it comes to like skin types, kind of, we'll use me as a, a, a slight example yeah. because obviously people are looking right at me. So you can <laughs> kind of understand my complexion and whatnot. Yeah. Can you look at somebody and like just in general before you kind of come over to me and, and do you look at someone and notice their skin? Like when you're, yes. is that a subconscious? Like, so it's a yes. So if someone came yes. up to you, that's the first thing you see. 
Yes. <laughs> oh, Which gosh. is terrible. It's terrible. So, um, yes, it's terrible. I mean, if the lighting is very, isn't very good, then I can't, I have to, like, I can't really see. Uh, okay. But I can see through makeup. Does, does that annoy yeah. if you can't really tell? You're yes. like, I, I, I don't know. Can I, I can't get my analyze iPhone you. Light out? Yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I just have a closer look? I my magnifying glass in the room. <laughs> Before we get bag. to know each other, I just need to know how your skin is. Your skin is. Yeah, it, no, it's really terrible. And, like, I've broken up with boyfriends because their skin is bad, which wow. I know is sad. I know, seriously. <laughs> really? I'm kidding. Yeah, because I'm like, I can't, I just can't deal. Like, have I, you you tried to deal. help them? Yes. Okay, and they're and not really interested. No, and I'm like, I can't, I just, this is not going to, I can't do, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't work with you. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow, there you go. Like, I, I mean, this is, again, that's another thing to bring back to our, like, the, the correlation between self-confidence because yeah. probably subconsciously, I mean, people are often very sensitive with what people might think of their skin yeah. and then obviously how they feel about their own skin they're two massive topics so okay there we go that's interesting i mean it's similar to me in that sense with the gym like yeah. so i can understand it from that perspective i don't think you're being like what's the word like or it wouldn't be judgmental of any kind well, because it's in a, yeah but i mean outside of that even when you yeah. meet people right like because it's our profession, we kind of, yeah. s that's the first thing we'll see. Like I'll see someone who's clearly like not in shape and I'll see that quite quickly. And then you mm -hmm. kind of get to put two and two with their habits or what they're eating. You know, I'll walk through a food court sometimes and subconsciously you'll see someone's out of shape. Then you'll see what they're eating and you'll kind of like paint a little picture of, <laughs> about what's happening there without even really knowing them, which isn't, you know, not fair, but it's also part of what we do, right? Yeah. So yeah no, I, I in mean, different respects. Like I was getting my nails done this morning and um, the, the nail technician next to me had really bad melasma, which is a pigmentation problem. And I was like, should I say something or should I just leave it? And I, I've learned not to say anything because you can just... just I you know. Just get it's yourself a into a pit. Because you could be an everyday hero <laughs> yeah, and really exactly. go around and say, hey, look, this will change your life. Just trust me. Like, yeah, this is my, like, is my, like, cert, my business card. Like, you don't have to see me, but see someone. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, exactly. But it's obviously such a trick, like, a sensitive yeah. point for people, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we need to tread carefully, but let's, we don't <laughs> yes. need to tread as carefully with me. No. So if you were to look at me, let's say, yeah. Um, what would you see? Well, you have great skin, um, and, but you have, you're a darker skinned, or you're just tan? Because I, I remember mean, asking yeah, you this I before. Because like, what's your ethnicity? Because I've asked so you this before. The background is Lebanese, yes. obviously Australian, but the bloodline is Italian, Maltese, and that's Lebanese. Why. Okay, so that's why you have like a, an olive skin type. Yeah, so. but like, I mean, I don't know if you can see it. Like, but like my, my skin is definitely light, lighter than my tan, yeah. if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. It's lighter than your tan. So you, you're definitely in tan. I'm tan. I mean, I you, have, I'm tan. you have great skin. Obviously, I see you in the gym almost every single day. And like, obviously, the first thing I, I noticed about you was like, oh, he has really good skin. <laughs> so oh, that's really <laughs> nice to know. <laughs> see, I hope Vic's listening to this because she gets angry when I don't do my evening skincare routine. What's your evening skincare routine? So I've been going through, it's basically I do without, I can't even remember the name. A Aesop, but I mean, it could be anything, but okay. it's, it's got a cleanser. Oh, Aesop. A A A Aesop? It is yeah, Aesop, Aesop yeah. yeah. So it's a cleanser. That'll, it's quite posh. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I probably definitely don't need to be doing this. Um, well, yeah, I mean, if we look at Vic's cabinet, there's about a thousand different serums that happen every single night. So right. she's very strict with I'm sure that sure she regime. wants everyone to know that. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. It's out there now. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing her straight under that bus. But... Over on my side of the cabinet, there's just, I'll exfoliate in the shower, like on my nose With mainly. like a scrub? With like a scrub. It's like a just, Can, yeah, like, it's just a scrub, like a L'Oreal one from like the pharmacy really. Right, yeah, good. Yeah, then well, it's quite yeah. like harsh. Yes. Like, so I feel like it's doing something. Mm. And then I'll get out, obviously dry my face. I'll put the, it's a, it's a cleanser first with a bit of water. I don't know if that needs to happen. I think maybe I've just done that. I don't know. Okay. So you get out of the shower and then cleanse your face. Yeah, that is a bit strange. That is a bit strange. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I'll do it after the shower. Yeah, that's true. So I'll hmm. cleanse it in the sink. Yeah. And then I'll put then a toner with like a bud, which is like makes it kind of, it's like a warm Like a cotton feeling. ball, you mean? Cotton ball, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I like dab and like kind of wipe. This is what it says on the back of the, bo of the box, by the way. You're this following is, this instructions. Is, this is my instructions <laughs> off the bottle. And then uh, I'm not alone. For sure everyone else is doing this too, I hope. Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of wiping my face, I guess. And like a li little bit of like, I would say dirt or whatnot comes off. Like it's not like clean bud afterwards. So I'm like thinking it's doing something. And then I'll put the moisturizer on. Okay. And it, I do feel, it does feel amazing. Like okay. the nights that I do it, I'm not consistent enough though. That's, that's probably my problem. But what are you so trying to do with that? Do you think that helps? Do you think that's well, It depends what you're anything? trying to do. What are you trying to do? I mean, I saw an ad on Instagram where Brad Pitt, <laughs> like I'm not kidding you. The power it's of like, Instagram. <laughs> honestly, 
it was saying Brad Pitt never misses his skincare regime. Of course and if, he doesn't. If you've looked at Brad Pitt recently, he's looking great. <laughs> so I was like, I definitely need to implement something which I'm not consistent about. And he even said, I do it twice a day. Oh my God. Is that, is that some great marketing? Have I been great locked marketing. in? You have. So okay. I would, if, so, okay, if, I was, if you came to me and said, my skin's great, you have great skin. So yeah, you have great skin. Everyone okay. should know that. Yes. There's nothing okay. wrong with your skin. Okay. Yes, you don't have any problems. But if you're going to do a skincare routine to keep your skin healthy in the long term, there's a couple of things I would change. Okay. Okay. So I would ditch the scrub, though I know you like that. The shower scrub. Yeah. Okay. Because you don't, no one needs to exfoliate your face. Your skin naturally exfoliates itself. You don't need to help it along because you're more likely to cause a little bit of irritation, redness, problems if you do that, right? Okay. So that may be why the toner feels a bit burny. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah, yeah it's, it is a burning It's because you just scrubbed your face. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then, and a toner has alcohol in it, which is why it feels like that. And then the cleanser after the shower. You, you can just cleanse your face with your body wash in the shower. You don't have to use a separate cleanser okay. unless you really want to. Okay. Um, so that whole idea that you need a separate face cleanser and body cleanser, I mean, they're all the same, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, and unless, well, this is for, so if you need to remove makeup, so if you're female, obviously that's, you need a different type of cleanser, but that's different. And then, so for you, being a male, um, you could just come out of the shower, pat your face dry, and just put your moisturizer on. So toner, again, you're doing two things that are like in- irritating your skin. You're scrubbing it, and then okay. you're putting this alcohol-based thing on. And I know you feel like it's cleaning What's something. The, yeah, what is the idea behind the toner? I have no idea. Okay. So this is in my book. It's, one of the, it's in the chapter of stuff you don't need. Toner yes. is a whole section. Okay. So I go into depth about, I can't even remember now. I go into detail about why toner is total crap. So it's just like a marketing gimmick. It's, it's, I think it comes from Clinique. They originated the toner. Mm. Um, yeah, I feel like they, yeah. a lot of these companies like to have a stage. Pro, like, oh, yes, of it's course. It's like this is our six stages to like your perfect skin. And then you're putting on all these different. I mean, there's yeah. more because there's got to be more because Vic's got more. But like <laughs> there's more. There's definitely <laughs> more steps. But do you get what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people are just, I mean, I'm falling for it. A lot yeah, of, do you, everyone does. Are you having this chat with people quite oh, often? Oh my god, yeah. My this is what my entire like my the premise of my entire book is is basically don't use all this crap. You don't. No one needs any of this. They're just trying to sell you stuff. Yeah. So skincare to me is a luxury product. So just like I like certain brands of shoes, you okay. know, you you like certain types of skincare like brands of skincare. Yes. But I don't need to buy Dior sandals. I can buy Havianas and they do just the same job. That's very true. Right? Yes. Same with like, you can buy a 300 pound pot of creme de la mer, but you can buy the Nivea that costs one pound from Tesco and it'll do the same, basically the same product. They probably come from the same factory anyway. Mm. So it's like this, they're just differently packaged and marketed. Yes. So really, there's no such thing as essential skincare. Um, and all of it's a luxury item. So you don't really need any of it. You, yes. you probably find just using nothing at all. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't consistently use to probably say that it's because of this. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think you necessarily need to do it, but if, if I were to tell you, if you were to say, you know, t- ask me, what should I change? I'm like, well, just ditch the toner, ditch the scrub, just shower, and then pat your face dry, put moisturizer on. Because we, we, you live here, you're exposed to sun, you sweat, air conditioning, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah okay, but hydration at night is probably not a bad idea just to okay. keep your skin looking fresh. Okay. But that's basically all I I mean, do. I think that can be managed. That like cut down 15 minutes yeah. down into a three minute like little yeah, totally. routine. Okay. And Absolutely. this is, that's crazy. Cause I think people kind of expect, like, I think what people assume is that the people with the nicer skin are going through some routine Yeah, and, and they don't obviously yeah. take into account all the pre, like all the personal different conditions, right? Yeah. I mean, the way your skin looks is 80% genetic, just like with mm. fitness, the way your body looks, the way, you know, how big or small you are, whatever, it's like 80% genetic, 10% what you eat, 10% what you do in the gym. I mean, that's yeah. an often quoted stat. I think with skincare, it's the same. 80% genetic, like you, you choose your parents wisely, make sure they have nice skin, yeah. um, don't smoke and don't go in the sun. There you go. And if you don't, if you don't go, if you don't smoke, don't go in the sun that much and you have good genetics, you'll have good skin regardless of what you put on your face. Okay. It doesn't really make a difference. So then if my skin's looking okay, yeah. I spend a lot of time in the sun. Yeah. Yes. Um, Bad. From Brisbane in Australia, I, gosh, like I was saying when I was talking like about writing notes about today's episode, I was thinking, gosh, I just need to be careful because my mom's listening and my mom hates how much I spend time in the sun. But back when I was growing up, I used to put olive oil no uh, joke. Like I put olive oil on my whole body. Great. Even a bit of the face. Nice. And I'd lie by the pool for hours. So I had a gap year during when I finished high school and I started my job. And the morning ritual from about 10 to about 1 
it would have been that long because I'd fall asleep. I would mm. lie in the sun. I, you're, I should probably book in for a consult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I was just thinking, <laughs> I'll just book in on the way out. <laughs> like, but I literally put olive oil on me and yeah. I would lie in the sun. So okay. talk to me about a little bit about obviously areas that have, are there, is, it, is there such thing as areas of the world where you can be at more risk of sun exposure? And then how can that kind of relate to the individual? What's your thoughts around sun exposure? Right, so, okay, so um, sun exposure is in areas closer to the equator where you have more sun exposure, like, for example, here mm. um, in Dubai, you, would, you have m- a much more sun exposure, so your risk of getting in the sun is much higher. So in England, we don't have that much sun. You know, it's not a huge problem. But the main issue isn't really where you live, it's your skin color and okay. your ethnicity. Okay. So this is where ethnicity becomes extremely relevant, yes. right? So because you have this kind of, um, Lebanese, I, I, I don't want to say the wrong, uh, you're not middle, it's not Arab, you're not yeah, Arab. It's a me- it's I would a, say the Mediterranean, Mediterranean. Is what the, that's what I've heard before. Mediterranean, when yeah. When they analyze it, yeah. There you go. So yeah. Mediterranean skin type, you're, uh, like we use um, something called Fitzpatrick skin typing, which is just giving a number uh, to your skin type depending on how quickly you burn and how okay. quickly you tan. So a Fitzpatrick skin type one is like, more, one or two is me. Like I'm very red. I always burn in the sun. I basically I can tan, but it would take some work. Okay. Um, and I'm at very high risk of skin cancer. Okay. okay. So a skin type six is an Af- Afro Caribbean person or a black person where their risk of skin cancer is basically like virtually zero. Yes. They can burn, but they're naturally protected from the damaging effects of the sun because they have so much pigment in their skin. Okay. And so you are in between that. So okay. you're like a four because you tan. You you don't really burn. Y- okay. Right, so your yes. risk of skin cancer yeah. is, is really quite low, even though you lived in Australia, which automatically increases your risk just because you were there. So, yeah. you know, you're kind of in the middle. Because I'm just joining the dots. I obviously, recently, uh, you shared it, and I had seen it as well, like Hugh Jackman just oh, yeah. recently mentioned that he'd had another skin cancer cut out, and he's had quite a few now, I think. Yeah, he's had a couple of BCCs on his nose. Yeah, now. so he's Australian, grew up in Australia. Yeah. Um, are these popping up now because he was exposed to sunlight growing up or at certain points in his life or is he just in that risk category that you mentioned where his genetics yeah. aren't you know a four or a five they're a one or a two so it's both okay. so if you're a one or two skin type and you never exposed to the sun your risk of skin cancer is going to be very low okay i'm assuming hugh jackman grew up in australia i'm, I'm assuming also but i'm not sure yes. but let's just say he has yes. um and he is a light skin person it's the damage he accumulated when he was a child so up to the age of about 20, 25 years old, that's, that's the peak time. So that is going to show up in your skin when you're 50. So I don't know how old he is, but 50, 60, yeah, he's 70. Closing his 60s, he's closing his 60s. Yeah. So that, that you won't, if you were going to get some kind of a, what's called a non-melanoma skin cancer, mm. like a head and neck sun-related cancer, it wouldn't occur until you're at least 50 or 60. So okay. you have some time to wait. But and I, I can only wait, you, right? Basically, like, you I can can't only wait. prevent it now. Damage is done. The damage is done, but that doesn't mean you should just go on the sun. You should still not, you know, should protect your skin from the sun, don't okay. burn, etc. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that it's the damage that you do as a child and when you're younger. So I think that the kids growing up now, parents are so aware of this. Well, the majority of them are. So most kids never expose the sun. At least okay. not the ones I see. Yeah. Um, and so th- we're not going to have as much of a skin cancer problem probably in the next. 50 years when these kids are grown up mm. than we have now because now it's a major problem mm. so non-melanoma skin cancer is the most common cancer ever basal cell carcinoma so what Hugh Jackman had yeah so that's mega mega you know common now and you, th- um, you think we'll be more cautious moving forward yeah I think the the, the generation now that's getting it is the the generation of olive oil <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> lying in the yeah, sun yeah, yeah. you know baby oil whatever um like my parents for example i mean both my parents have had skin cancers relatively mild but they grew up in that era where in the 50s 60s where you just didn't have sunscreen yeah you just know better didn't know better so yeah okay we'll see the thing is my grandmother was from the uk like yeah so on one side she's straight like uk she would have had hundreds of skin cancers removed do you right. think despite my complexion that i would that would elevate my risk in there or potentially a okay. so genetic risk. Yeah. From a, from like, if you had parents who have had skin cancers. Yes. So that, that is a, that is definitely a, so yeah. you should be more cautious if your mom and or your dad has, or your Absolutely. grandparents have Absolutely. had them removed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Though a basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common kind of skin cancer is not, we don't think it's genetic unless you have a genetic, there's a genetic disease called Gorlin's disease, which is a basal cell carcinoma predisposing disease, but that's very specific. But generally speaking, it's probably more lifestyle related than it is genetic. Okay. Unlike melanoma, which is more of a genetic thing. 
Okay, so that could potentially come down the lines. Yeah. All right, so when we compare the difference between female and male skin, yeah. that is a thing. There are differences or, or no? So let's say I'll, I'll give you like a yeah, little scenario. Me. Brother, sister. Yeah. Same family, same like parents, genetics, bloodlines, yeah. et cetera. Will their skin... I mean, of course... As you mentioned, individuals will have different circumstances, like but male and female, what's that like? So the main difference in, in brothers and sisters as teenagers will be uh, the acne thing. Getting, it's, it's, okay. That's the main... The acne is probably the most common skin disease besides eczema of all time, so okay. that's why it's something I can talk a lot about. But um, And it affects like 99% of people. So the, the male will almost certainly have worse acne than the female if there's going to be acne. Yeah. Because the, the hormones are higher, the drive is higher, the, just everything's more intense for men. So that would be the main difference. But generally speaking, I know this is going to be controversial. I don't think there's a lot of difference between men and women in terms of skin. Skin care. So, so yeah. would you say they don't need to do anything too different when it comes to looking after their skin? Pretty much. Which, it, again, goes against every single marketing skincare product yeah. on the planet. So the fact that there's even male skincare ranges is just insane. Because there's no... I mean, it, it just smells different. So you would feel quite confident having two patients with the same you know, skincare needs... Yeah. Just going and getting the same product. Same product. And using it regularly, etc. Pretty much, yeah. You don't need to use a male-specific product or whatever, or something in a pink package if you're female. You, know, yeah. just, you just use anything. These products are all pretty much the same. And again, I get in a lot of hot waters for saying that too. I say things like, all cleansers are the same. And everyone's like, that's not possible. You know, this cleanser has this in it. And it says, I'm like, no, in the end, they're all surfactants. They just clean. So yes, there's oil-based ones. There's foaming cleansers. There's balm cleansers. But really... The bottom line is they all do the same thing. It comes down to personal preference and what mm. you like to use. Some people don't like balm cleansers. Some people like foaming cleansers. The same with moisturizers. Some people like things that feel greasy. Some people like gels, whatever. But in the end, they, they all try to do the same thing, which is stop water from leaving your skin, which okay. is what hydration is. Yes. Hydration is the amount of water in your skin. So yeah, I wouldn't say there's any difference. Okay, there you go. So if you found a formula that works for you... Yeah, just use it. Just use it. Yeah. Wow. Keep it simple. That is a huge one. And Keep it cheap. Yeah, because it can add up. It can definitely yeah, add up. Yeah. Some of the, I, I mean, I remember when, it, oh God, Vic's going to hate me. But like, <laughs> I'm only using her as an example because I, she's obviously the number one female in my life. Yes. So oh, I spend a lot of my nice. time with her. <laughs> and when we go shopping, we end up in like, you know, Sephora, et cetera. And we're Never looking, go to Sephora. Oh, okay. Why? <laughs> Why? Because there's so many, they're there. I mean, obviously they're there to sell you stuff. It's very, like, there's a lot happening in there, isn't there? There's a lot happening. It's yeah. extremely confusing. There's tons of skincare, and they'll, they'll tell you that everything, you need everything, and you need this mask, and you need this serum, and this serum, and this for day, and this for night, and this, oh, my God. It, it is the store I hate the most. Like, I just, I, I just will. <laughs> I, I have to there. agree with you there. So, yeah. <laughs> like, I also don't like just, Sephora no. for that reason. Okay, so, all right. Well, it's good to know, because, yeah, when you walk in there, you do see a massive price difference in different products. Oh, yeah. It's honestly, I, I would say for me as just an average person going in, it's extremely overwhelming. And yes. I almost just walk back out going, I'm just going to do nothing because <laughs> I don't even know what to do. Which the six good. balm treatment that Brad mentioned is expensive. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do now. So, it, so the answer is... Just, just use Vaseline at night. You're good. Vaseline at night. Yeah. Why Vaseline? Well, so because Vaseline is the, the most occlusive thing you can use. So occlusive means that it blocks, it basically creates a, a barrier to water loss. So it's 90% occlusive, which means it stops 90% of water loss from your skin when you apply it to your skin. It's almost like putting cling film um, or, yeah, cling film. Yeah, yeah, yeah That's yeah. what you call it, cling film. Yeah. Plastic stuff on your hand overnight and just left it there. That would, stop, that would make your hands look really hydrated the next day because it just stops water from leaving your skin. Because you lose like okay. a substantial amount of water through your skin throughout the day and through the night, especially if you sleep in air conditioning and stuff like that. Okay, so, amazing. So Vic, yeah. I know you're listening. Vaseline, Vaseline is okay because last time... I gave you a kiss goodnight on the cheek, and I tasted, I think it was vitamin C. <laughs> it was, vitamin C shouldn't, is apparently not supposed to be used at night anyway, but whatever. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm in so much That's trouble cute, after this. <laughs> but hey, look, you're getting some top professional doctor <laughs> advice here. So, uh, I will say on the house, so you can thank me later. <laughs> yeah. But that was the most uncomfortable taste before bed. Nice. So, you know, there we go. <laughs> so, okay, you've got Sephora packed with people. Yeah. Uh. Obviously, a lot of the same people in there are, you know, as most of us are today, quite heavily engaged in social media. Yeah. Those people are probably spending thousands of money on their skincare and yes. then they're throwing a filter on <laughs> to their 
photos that they're putting up there. They're obviously, when it comes to going, hey, this is what I look like, that a lot of people these days are very quick to throw filters in front of their face that they're also on the side trying to keep in perfect condition using all these overpriced brands that, like we've said, are not doing what they, they say they're doing or they're yeah, not necessary. Yeah. Why is that? Like, why do you think people have... I mean, aside from obviously all the other makeup aspects and, and f physical features, because I know that's not necessarily your department, but this is part of like that mm. process. What impacts do you think skincare and, and, and I guess skin have on the self-confidence of like, you know, today's generation, I think more than probably most. More than most. ever before, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like the, the social media culture, everyone's just like, um, you know, the high definition cameras and all mm. this other stuff. You can see real details in someone's skin. And I think that's part of what's, or a huge component of what's driven the skincare industry to become such a mega industry over the past five to 10 years. So it's really, it's surpassed makeup or what called color cosmetics um, yeah. in, in kind of the financial world and in, in, really? in the skincare. So skincare is like the biggest thing ever, which is why there's literally a new skincare brand. I mean, l literally every day, there's like a wow. new brand with something new and fantastic that you just have to have and it's all over Instagram yeah. um, or whatever, TikTok. And it, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's just, it's just getting ridiculous now. And why do you, why do you think skin, like, why do you think skin has such a big impact on these people, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, having clear skin looks good. Like having yeah. nice, even skin, that's what filters do. Yeah. You know, before filters, we wouldn't even think about that. Yeah. Um, but filters are a relatively new concept in, which we can all use now. So everyone yes. has flawless skin and everyone thinks that's real. Yeah. Real skin isn't filtered. So real skin has irregularities. It has little bumps. It has shadows. You know, it has texture to it. That's normal. Skin should look like that. Mm. You know, only if you put, I mean, a filter on, do you literally have that kind of airbrushed appearance. Yeah. So normal skin has a certain appearance, but normal isn't acceptable anymore. That's you right. Know, you have to be super abnormal or whatever, super normal um, to have good skin. And it's made everyone so paranoid about the way their skin looks that, I mean, I have women who are 20 coming in saying, I, what can I do to prevent my crow's feet lines? Can I have Botox now? And I'm like, no, you're 20. Go, go and live your life. Like, come back in 20 years and I'll do your Botox, you know, or give you whatever. So um, I think this, this obsession with staying young, it's affecting all ages. Yes. Um, and it's kind of sad because when I was 20, it didn't even occur to me to look at my wrinkles. Yes. I mean, you're, how old are you? I can't I'm remember. 28. Okay, well, I'm 42, right? So you may, you kind of grew up in this more of a social media kind of thing. Just, I was just. on the edge. You're like, on the edge, yeah. Yeah, I get, I totally, I can see it with people that I deal with, like, you know, my friends who are having kids yeah. and like, you know, they're all like sisters, younger sisters of my mates, et cetera, going through like almost unrecognizable changes mm. visually just visually, through like yeah. Botox and, and, and that whole cosmetic side. Yeah, so I think it's really it's really emotive, and these market these skincare companies they know how to market to that emotion, mm. and you know we can you know this may diminish the appearance of fine lines. This 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 will give you this you know um, flawless filter because even the names of these products like um, the flawless filter cream, the magic cream, you know mm. these even the names make you think that it's going to make you look like an airbrushed model from you know whatever. Yes. So um, and I think that's really sad because. You know, I think we all need to just take a step back and be like, what is reality here? That's right. And what, what can we achieve with skincare? Not a lot, right? So there's not, you know, there's only a few things that actually do anything helpful to skin for general anti-aging, and it's it's not going to cost you a fortune, and you're not going to buy it at Sephora. Mm. So, um, you know, I think I think generally it's 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 a big problem. So um, I try to help my patients kind of realize that they have great skin, if they do. Unless they have a problem, then I tell them. But otherwise, I'm like, you have really nice skin. This is normal. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's only so much you can do to make it perfect. Yes. So. I mean, I, like, I love what you're saying because I think the definition of, like, feeling comfortable in your own skin mm. is something that a lot of people now, they don't. They don't have, yeah. They don't have. What do you think can help somebody feel more confident in their own skin. Aside from like, from a, from a, like a face perspective, like, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You and I know this because I think we've probably gone through our own like fitness journeys, which we're going to yeah. touch on very shortly. Yeah. Um, what has helped you feel potentially more confident in yourself, in your own skin, if there's ever been a point where you haven't been? With literally my skin. Well, I mean, I had acne when I was a teenager. I had rosacea when I was younger. Mm. Um, it took me a long time to kind of feel comfortable with my, how my skin looks and not want to put loads of makeup on. But one thing was becoming a dermatologist and kind of understanding mm. 
what how skin functions and what what normal skin is really yes. like, and also treating my own skin problem. Yes. So you know, I treated my rosacea. I haven't had a problem with my skin for years, um, and so basically, the correct treatment used correctly to fix a correct diagnosis, yes. that will make a huge difference. So I think if you have an actual problem with your skin, like literally, literally a problem, then seek out the correct, I know it's easy for me to say that, but it can be hard to find the correct care from an actual expert and not an influencer on YouTube. That's a big one. That will really help. And then also try to step away from the magnifying mirrors because mm. everyone looks bad in a magnifying mirror. Everyone, mm. right? You're meant to have pores on your face. They're supposed to be there. Okay. Like, that's normal. Yes. So, um, so if you look in the magnifying mirror, you're going to freak yourself out at every time. So just, and also just a, kind of a reality check. Like, actually, does my skin actually look that bad? No, it probably doesn't. So, you know, but it's hard. It, you know, but then you go to a cosmetic clinic, and they'll tell you that there's 10 things wrong with you, and you have to buy this box of treatment, and they'll fix it. So there, I'm, I'm, try, I'm, I'm like fighting a, almost like a losing battle constantly. I know. I, I'm admiring how strong you've stuck to your standpoint yeah. in this whole episode and I can even just and anyone listening can just probably understand how big that other side of that fight is because like you said it's the marketing it's the, the everything's working against you and <laughs> and the truth I would say and yeah. the simple the simple truth because money always wins you know yeah. so everyone's trying to make money off of these products off of everything and I you know I'm not a saint by any means, but like my, my job is to help people do the correct thing mm. and help them live their lives better or in whatever way I can. Yes. And that's what I train to do. So I can't go around selling total crap or telling you to buy 10 serums that aren't going to do anything. That's, yes. I, that so goes ev against everything that I am meant to be doing. Yes. So I, I have, it's, I'm really, I feel really strongly about this. Yes. Um, and I just, in my, my whole goal in life is to help people have feel comfortable in their skin, yes. which is exactly what you said. Yeah, and that's yeah. like literally like we couldn't have summarized like the skin care side of this podcast today with those few points there because yeah. I think they're absolutely true and they're, they're ones that you guys should definitely just re-listen to, <laughs> rewind for the last 30 seconds. Just listen to that again because it is such valuable advice and it's, very, it's come from a very, very genuine and, and uh, qualified place. Oh. Yes, so thank you. we appreciate that, uh, Dr. Natalia. Thank you. So moving into like a bit more of the passionate side, as we kind mm. of come towards the end of the podcast today, we're going to just touch on health and wellness. Mm. What role does that play in your life? Because we train in the same gym. Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> yesterday, Ty said to me, so Ty's um, Natalia, Dr. Natalia's trainer. Yeah. Um, who's a mutual friend and he's like I've been dropped in the last three episodes and you definitely need to mention me today because then it'll be four so worry, we'll mention you we are mentioning you. mentioning you but we spend time in the gym every day yeah, what okay. part does that have or what role does that play in your in the rest of your life because we've heard about like obviously your career side but mm. you're obviously very enthusiastic about the gym as well yeah so um, I mean I've always been a gym goer but that stems from me being um, being a fat child so I was a I was a very fat child I wanted yes. to ask about this because I read an article, but I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna let you speak first, and then yeah. I'm gonna because then show you what I saw, like when I was doing a bit of research for today. Oh God. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I was a fat child. So basically, um, I struggled with my weight all through my teens and my twenties, and um, I did every sport imaginable with the goal of not being fat anymore. Okay. okay. So, and I went through times where I was very not fat. I don't want to say thin because that's not the right word, yeah. but I was not fat, but okay. I'm a stocky person. I'm only five foot three and I've always been quite, um, kind of, uh, people always say that I was big boned. I'm like, no, I, I just think I'm just kind of chubby. Um, <laughs> I don't like that oh, that yeah, term gets so thrown like around big a lot. Bones. Yeah, no. Um, so I, I kind of battled with this. I, I grew up in the United States where obesity is kind of a problem anyway. So I grew up in this environment, which wasn't conducive to healthy living, though my parents tried their best. Um, but I went through all my 20s kind of really being unhappy with my physique generally. And I was a personal trainer. Yeah, I, I don't, you didn't probably know what? that. I worked no. as a personal trainer all through medical school. I know. I mean, it explains why you're so efficient at training. Yeah. Like, you're lifting <laughs> quite good. <laughs> well, I it's taken years to learn, but yeah. um, I did. I, I taught spinning classes. You know, I used to teach body pump. I used to teach body combat oh, and all wow. those Les Mills fully, you know, certified instructor. So you I went through Les all Mills this. certified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, I did everything. I, I did the whole thing. That funded my medical school, like life. Amazing. Basically. So I did all that. Um, as a medical student, and then, but I never really got to the physique I wanted to have. I was never happy with the way my body looked. Okay. Um, and then slowly, 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 I got. I had a, a cycling accident, so I stopped doing triathlon because in my twenties I did Ironman triathlon. Seriously, okay. wow. again, cardio is you, the key to fat loss. Not really. <laughs> so, 
Oh, that was what really? it was. Yeah. So, so you were training for an Ironman. I did two full distance Ironmans. You have completed. I have. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's on um, my bucket list. One day. Is it? Oh, at God. one at one stage, one Ironman. Yeah. I mean, that's a straight. <laughs> uh, it sounds stupid, even me saying it, but I'm very impressed by that. So, yeah. So people break don't down know that. an Ironman just for those who don't know. So it's um it's a triathlon, a swimming, cycling, running, and it's an Ironman is the longest distance. I think it's like a four kilometer swim. Uh, it's a marathon at the end, and it's 180 kilometers on the bike. Okay. Yeah, so it takes. It took me 12, 13, 14 hours, somewhere around Huge. there. It's probably one of the most grueling, grueling things. Like, yeah. I guess, events that, was, that can be done. It was pretty terrible. Yeah, we'll never do that again. I hate running. Never. Do, and I hate <laughs> swimming, too. I, don't I can't imagine so you doing that now. Like, yeah. from the way Especially. I see you train now, it's totally different. My body would just not handle it. Um, but so, basically, I had a cycling accident when I was, like, 29 30 and I it was pretty bad so that stopped me from cycling completely I just said I can't do this it was too much of a risk for my career because yes. I hurt my I hurt my knee I hurt my hand I hit my head and if I can't function like with my hands I can't I can't do my job so like this is this is too risky so I'm going to stop this completely so I stopped triathlon completely and it I faffed around a bit for a few years and someone said to me you kind of have the build to be a bodybuilder and I was like really and I used to look at the bodybuilding magazines for women that they don't exist anymore now, which is kind of sad. I know the ones you're talking like about. Like Oxygen Magazine. Yeah, 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 such yeah. a great magazine. Yeah. And I was always like admiring these women with these six packs and these like delts. And I was like, one, it, it would be so cool if one day I ever looked like that. Yes. I just, but I'd never thought that was realistic because I was like, I was, a, I was like a fat child doing Ironman didn't make me skinnier because uh, cardio doesn't make me skinnier. Were you still carrying like weight? Yeah, I was still during, chubby. You know? uh, so around your 30, post yeah. accident, you were still not happy with your condition? No, I, I was, um, I had a DEXA scan in 20. 16 and I was 40% body fat. Yeah, so this is the article. So the oh, article no. I saw oh, was you actually in a fit, it was from the Times, I think, from <laughs> yes, the UK. From the on New Year's Day. Is that, yeah, That's and, and you're yes. in, you, you had done a fitness shoot. Yes. That was the cover shot. Yes. And like you, you actually were very toned and, and, and well shaped. Yeah. But then the caption below said, when I'd heard that I was 40%, I decided to yeah. make a change. So yeah. I, and I looked at the picture and I was like, 40%? I was like, that's something I definitely didn't know. So No, I have no pictures from that time. No, I do have yeah. pictures. <laughs> wow. You're never going to see them. Well, yeah. <laughs> so then talk to me about that conditioning between 40% and that. I, it would look like a lifestyle shoot because you, you, yes. you were lean. Yeah, I mean, I did a bikini competition. Okay, so um, that's where that came from. Yeah, and then I did that shoot just because I was like lean. Um, I, I wasn't, I didn't have, I mean, I was skinny, but I didn't have much muscle mass at okay. all. Um, even though at the time I thought I was jacked, which is really, just looking back, it's just I mean, so funny when you... <laughs> you're actually not bad. I'll give you that. Like, you're that in bad. shape. It you're wasn't definitely that bad. in shape. So, but then that's where it kind of started. So I had, I started to, I had, a, I got a coach who, um, you know, helped me prepare for the bikini competition. Then I, I kind of realized that I could, this is something that, that I kind of like to do. Um, but then it continued to go up and down a bit. I got more muscular as the years go on, as you do training more different trainers, different types of things. Yeah. And I did a figure competition like 2016, 2017. I competed in figure in the UK BFF. Yes. Um, and then I did another one and I didn't do very well because looking back, I, I wouldn't have done very well. Um, and then I unfortunately went through a relationship where my partner didn't want me to do it anymore. Okay. So he was very anti, um, he didn't want me being on stage in a bikini in front of other okay. people. Yes. And so he was like, either you do that sport or me. So it's either one or the other. Uh, so, and yeah. you'd been doing it, obviously having met. So yeah, it so wasn't something that was new. Exactly. Was so I was like, all doing. right. So then I decided it was 2018. I was like, all right, um, I'd rather have my long-term relationship than do the sport I like. Hmm. And that's, it, I mean, I, it's just so weird that I even let that happen to me because it's, anyway, um, a lot of people do make you that do, decision. You make at that the compromise, time. yeah, and yeah. you think, "Oh no, that's fine." But actually, looking back, I mean, that was terrible. So I gave up my sport completely and just faffed around. And then we, <laughs> that relationship ended, and I was like, "Well, now let me see what I can do." COVID ended. That relationship ended, and I was like, "Let me get back in the gym, and I'm going to give myself." like the time to see how good I can make myself look in terms of bodybuilder. And bodybuilding. Your, your mind was set on those magazines. But yeah, pretty much from like, like from like 20 classic, 2002. Like bodybuilder shape. Classic female bodybuilder. Cause I, I know I have that type of build. I'm stocky and short and I put on muscle mass easily. So it's like, let me just, and I have been training with Menno, um, who's my like online coach from like 2017 and he'd helped me prepare for my other competitions. So I was like, Menno, I want to, I want to see how lean and shredded I can get. Yeah. And I was like, one day I'd like to have a pro card in wow. the IFBB. And he was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and a pro like, card basically sure. signifies like a place 
or for, is it first place? Or you have to win um, a, quali- a, a pro qualifier, yeah. T- to be recognized as... As a, a pro, and then you can pro. compete in the pro league, basically. Okay. So you can go to the Olympia if you yes. qualify. So, or the Arnold or whatever. So um, basically, I took 18 months to prepare, and um, I competed in September, yes. not thinking anything. And I won my regional, and then um, I went to the Arnold, the UK Arnold at the end of September, and I won everything I had entered, and then I got two pro cards. Incredible. So in both my categories, you was, I saw this. So it was, you totally clean stacked I just everything. Wiped. I. It, yeah. I, just, I mean, I could not. I was more surprised than like I think anyone else there. Yes. That I kept winning. I got nine first places, which is insane. And then so I did two categories: fig, figure and women's physique, which are slightly different. Um, and they gave me a pro card in each. And no one's ever done that in the history of the Arnold. And people are always like, "How do you do that? How do you train so hard and stick to your diet, but also work?" I'm like, I don't have kids. I don't have a husband. Like, it's just me, my diet, and my work. Yes. Like, so, yes, it's not easy, but it's way e- I couldn't do this if I had three kids and a husband to look after and a full-time job. Mm. So I think women are really hard on themselves. It's like, you know, if you're doing all this other stuff, you can't also be expected to, you know, be a bodybuilder. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, that's asking advice. too much. You know, just, you know, because, like, I, I'm not, I have the time, yes. and I don't have the distractions. Agree. So it's setting like realistic expectations. Realistic, You're yeah. like, can I become a bodybuilder? Does it affect my work? No, I can manage it. Does it affect anything else? No, let's go. Let's go. Exactly. And yeah. make it a priority. And Ty said, he's like, he's cause I, you know, I'm not dating anyone right now and I haven't for a long time. He's like, just don't date anyone for a while. Yeah. That changes <laughs> things, right? It's a bit like, it's just like any distractions, kids, yes. extra responsibilities, dating. Of yeah. Course. He was like, just, just be selfish. I'm like, I don't think it's, yeah. He's like, just prioritize. I was like, yeah. Okay. So you're telling me not to date. Yes. <laughs> like, pretty much. There like, you go. Okay. Ty Kubiak also <laughs> gives, you, Ty. gives dating advice. advice. Relationship <laughs> advice. We'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's amazing. And I, well, I mean, that's exactly so, so true. I think steering away from mass amounts of cardio, yeah. like you'd mentioned, obviously focusing on what you're eating mm. because that's the biggest one. Everyone loves to just try and out burn their intake, which we know is just almost impossible. impossible. It is literally impossible. <laughs> it's literally so impossible. do not fight it, guys. And that's an amazing bit of advice. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Dr. Natalia. The, that leads me to our final question for today, which is the Lifestyle Hub golden question. So what do you think the key is to living a, a happy and fulfilling lifestyle? Oh, that's, a, that's a big question. I'm going to say it's sleeping. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to elaborate on it. What, what do you, what, because we spoke about this at the start of the show. Did, you yeah. did mention about you're trying to keep a bit more importance around sleep. And this is good because a lot of people kind of always lead to a similar answer on this question. So I actually like your one. It's so important. Yeah. What, what is it about sleep do you think, you know, can lead to a fulfilling lifestyle? So I just think if you have enough rest and you're not fatigued, so if you sleep well every night, it allows you to excel in everything else in your day. Mm. I know that if, I mean, you're probably the same. If you don't get enough sleep, if I don't get enough sleep, I suck at everything. Mm. I'm grouchy. I don't train well. That makes me more pissed off. You know, I'm hungrier. I crave crap that I shouldn't be eating. I can't yeah. stick to my diet. You know, every, I can't manage my, I don't feel like I manage my patients well. I'm short with people. Like, everything just falls to pieces. Yes. So, I mean, that's how, it, it sounds dramatic, but I really feel that that's the case. So I I'm totally, I've become very obsessed with sleeping yes. and I will not let anything mess up my sleeping. And what's your, <laughs> what would be your routine then? You're trying to get to bed at a certain like time? Eight, I mean, like t- it's Saturday night. I'll probably go to bed about eight, okay. which I know sounds totally insane, but, and it's Saturday, but I, I, I can't go out at all. So I'm not, I'm not, cause I'm, I'm preparing to compete. So I'm not going out at all. I'm not going to go for dinner with anyone or anything like that. So I'm going to go to bed early and just get a good, like 10 hours of sleep tonight. And then I'll be really good tomorrow when I train and I'll feel really good tomorrow and everything will be good. But so that's, I'm, I think the one thing you can do, if you can get enough sleep and just prioritize that rest, mm. then you will be able to do all those other things that you, on Amazing. your to-do list. Yeah. Stick to your diet, train hard, be a nice parent or, or be that's a right. good boyfriend or girlfriend. Exactly. You know, all the other stuff will fall into line if you aren't tired all the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that's probably, I mean, one of the most sound bits of advice or, or phrases we've had because you're right everything stems from sleep quality and my, fine one night bad one bad night won't change things too when much when you're but, 26 yeah but the, <laughs> when, it, when you consistently yeah but even yeah. then even when you're consistently missing sleep yeah. I'm sure if you're out there thinking my life's all over the place mm. draw a line between your sleep patterns I can guarantee you you're probably not ticking the right boxes yeah eight hours at least there you go eight hours sleep 
Um, that big, big thank you, obviously, Dr. Natalia, for coming on the show Thanks and being so open and honest with us because I think that's, that is, this, the world is so full of different rumors, myths, people pushing different agendas. But I think the biggest thing that I took away from this conversation today was that you were very open and not hesitant to call the facts, um, aside from obviously the, the waves of, uh, I guess, misinformation that's out there that's continually trying to like bury, you know, the simplicity yeah, of, of, you know, the, the road to having like a healthy skincare routine and obviously keeping an eye on that kind of thing. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Where can our listeners obviously find more from you? Where are you practicing? Um, please, now's the perfect time to obviously talk about your book. Right, so I wrote a book. It's called Skin Intelligent: What You Really Need to Know to Get Great Skin, um, and it, it's available on Amazon, all, all all Amazons everywhere, and it's being translated to Chinese and Thai. Okay. Uh, which is going to be fun. Amazing. Yeah, cool. Uh, so <laughs> if you speak Mandarin uh, and you want to read it in, in Mandarin, that will be happening in about a year. Um, and you can get it, on, get it on Amazon. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, I do a lot of education. Well, my entire Instagram is based on just educational stuff. I don't do any paid promotions or anything like that um, on my Instagram. So Dr. Natalia Spearings is my um, uh, thing. Yep. And I also have a, a, a bodybuilding one. So Dr. Natalia underscore IFBB pro. Amazing. And you're practicing now here in Dubai? Yeah, King's College Hospital in Dubai, and I go between here and my practice in London. Okay, amazing. We'll pop all the links below in the bio, so be sure to please have a click and get to know Dr. Natalia a little bit further. Definitely follow her IG because, like she mentioned, it's very informative and very interactive. Um, a lot of the people, and I know people that have followed you who are very excited for this episode, <laughs> who actually listen to your lives, answer questions, get lots of information from your social channel. So keep doing what you're doing because the Thank people you. are very much appreciative. That's good. Thank That's you enough. so much. Thank you. Guys, what to expect next, next episode? I, I, I have been in the status of actually revealing each episode per week, but I think I'm going to just let that kind of sit in the back for you guys this week so you can see what... Leave it as a bit of a surprise so at the end of the week you can see what's coming. Um, before we go today, I do have a quick favor to ask. If you're enjoying the podcast, please let me know. You have a few minutes to spare. I'd love to read your reviews. I'd like to see more reviews, guys. I, I got a lot of people physically saying those to me, but it'd be nice for you to just pop them down in the comments below and I can spend a little bit more time going over what you liked and disliked about the show so I can make sure to give you content you all love to hear. Please subscribe to the podcast in the app that you're listening to. Um, so you can receive new episodes before they're released. Before we go, I'd like to give one last shout out to our sponsors at Ghana Fitness Supplies, the leading home and commercial gym specialists in the Middle East. Be sure to check them out at www.ghana.ae for all your fitness needs. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining me, Jason Grimmer, on the Lifestyle Hub podcast. I'll catch you later.